Thank you, Karen. I uh, see Don's here. I want you to know that I'm under a prohibition. That I'm going to be tasered. If I, when I, I did a talk on ticks, and it was like a tennis match. And they had neck strain, so I'm going to try to be better today. Um, Karen was talking about what I used to do. And, uh, about five or six years ago, after I retired, I went down to Providence to visit some friends who were speaking at a conference there, and I was on, on an elevator. And this fellow gets on, he keeps looking at me, looking at me, and he goes, Say, didn't you used to be Bob Emmons? <laughs> <laughs> um, the gentleman in the audience was uh, kind enough to <clears throat> bring in one of the masks, which I'm sure you've all seen, because that's why you're here. And uh, I'll pass it around. You can actually, in the first uh, stage, in, in first and second stages, which we'll talk about, the uh, hairs are not toxic. So you can actually, if you want to pull it apart, and you, well, yeah, you can see them laying there. Uh, note how tiny they are. Um, how incredibly small they are when they first come out of the nest. So, uh, so here it is. Um, originally, uh, Charlene Donahue, who's an entomologist for the State Fire Service, is going to give the talk. She's really the state authority on this insect, but she retired in December, unfortunately. But she's here in spirit because I have her uh, slide series that she put together right before she did retire. Um, I've been working with a woman named Allison Kanadi, who's also a state forest entomologist, who's been very helpful. So, anyway, um, I've got to get used to this microphone. I was telling Pam, I was speaking at Cornell once years ago when I had one on. You hear the hot mic thing, right? Um, the guy who taught him before me was very, very arrogant, very condescending to the people. So I took a break halfway through mine when I got to pick a water. This guy comes up and he says, what did you think of the earlier speaker? And I used that old expression. I, I, knew, they could, I knew they could pile up that high. I didn't know they could make a talk. <laughs> and all of a sudden I saw the woman who was coordinating him running on the <laughs> Uh, anyone recognize what this insect is known by uh, at home? Um, I'm sure you've all had them. This is the, uh, I wasn't going to walk. Um, it's a tomato hornworm. Okay. And uh, I just, I have this up because I didn't have a stage by stage life cycle of the uh, brown tail moth. But I want to take you back to eighth grade biology real quickly so that some of the terminology will make sense. Um, this is the life cycle. And again, this is the uh, tomato hornworm. But um, when we're talking about moths or butterflies for that matter, the adults uh, are very specialized. They have antennae for finding female and for finding a place to lay their eggs, the proper food, food plant. They, they recognize plants by the distinctive odor the plants give off. And in most cases, they never even feed. They're not specialized. There's no point. They may eggs are laid, they die. The caterpillars, however, are the other end of the specialization scale. They have virtually no sensory organs, no sexual organs. They're primarily a mouth, a stomach, and an anus, and that's it. Their whole function is to eat. And the faster they can put on weight, the quicker they can become adults. Um, so, anyway, so the female <coughs> will always lay the eggs right on the food source. So that when the eggs hatch, and that first tiny hut caterpillar comes out, all it has to do is open its mouth and it's eating. So it's a really sophisticated 
successful technique. Because the insects have exoskeletons, even caterpillars have external skeletons, right? As they grow, and they grow very rapidly, they periodically have to shed that exoskeleton and produce a new one that's bigger, just like in entomology we always gave the kind of bogus uh, example of a boy who was 10 years old and had a suit of armor and then he was 12 years old and one, whatever. But, um, so this is called molten. And when the insect first comes out of the egg, it is said to be in the first instar. That's the first immature stage. They're called larvae, or in this case, specifically caterpillars. And then it molds, second instar, it's a little bigger, third instar, it molds, molds again. Uh, it can molt anywhere from five to six to seven times in the case of a brown tail moth. Right? And you can see they increase significantly in size. Uh, one of the rules of insect control is the earlier you can intervene, the better. Obviously, when they're very small like this, they're not doing much damage in comparison to the larger insects, feeding ones. It's also true that if you're using an insecticide, it's much easier to kill the smaller ones. It takes a much smaller dose because of their smaller weight, and their exoskeleton is much thinner, so it's easier for an insecticide to penetrate and get into the nervous system. Um, anyway, if you have had trouble with a tomato worm, one of those big, ugly green worms, uh, right now, where they're sitting is in this pupil case, the top four to six inches in the soil, right where your tomatoes are here. So if you're really ambitious, you can <coughs> dig them up. And uh, if you have a small tomato, it's actually an efficient way to do it. All right. So that's the uh, life cycle of a typical moth, in a nutshell. This happens to be the male brown tail. You don't see the brown tail in this case. But what, do you see its antennae? Uh, no, actually you don't. They're tucked away right in here. These are mouth parts. Um, you see the antennae now? What do you think happened? What would cause this phenomenon? It smells the female. Right? Remember, the males, their only function is to mate and die. That's what they do. That's all they do. And so it's really critical that they have the ability to find a mate. So consequently, they have these incredibly large, sophisticated antennae. Um, you all know gypsy moths, right? The gypsy moths have the same phenomenon, the males. It's estimated that if you took a male gypsy moth and blew it up to our size, the appropriately sized antennae, it could smell a female in Omaha, Nebraska. <laughs> This is how, and of course with insects, the sense of smell is by far the primary sense. Everything is, well. so anyway, this guy, he, he smelled the chemical, he follows that chemical pheromone in the direction of the greatest concentration of molecules, and he ends up where he wants to be. Um, just a quick side light, side note. People are always curious, how do you tell the difference between a moth and a butterfly? Well, usually moths are, uh, butterflies are pretty and moths are bland. But that's not always the case. The absolute best way, butterflies always have some type of club on the end of their antennae. Moths can have lots of different types, but never that. Okay, the brown tail moth. Um, it was really interesting when I was working with this because, you know, coming from northern New York, we've had all the other major critters, but uh, the brown tail moth is, is just pretty much locked into the big coast area. It's not really found anywhere else in the U.S., which is a problem because 
if you're a regional or even a na national threat, what happens? The USDA and all the other states study it. Lots of information. In this case, Maine's got the whole ball. And uh, so, a lot of things that uh, we're still learning because of that. This happens to be a photomicrograph of the uh, <coughs> hairs on a tent caterpillar, but they're very similar. And you can see these little tiny barbs or spines coming off. Now that's the culprit. That's what causes the rash. So there's also a chemical that can be toxic that's involved too. And um, when they come into contact with the skin, they cause the rash. And it uh, like a very bad case of poison ivy. If you got that handout I put over there, there's information on where you can get the cream, and so forth and so on. There's a really good site uh, on Facebook. It's called the Mid Coast Brown Tail Moth Project. They have a lot of uh, non-scientific uh, you know, observations from people who have the rat videos of people who have the rash that, you know, show how bad it is. Uh, but it's the only problem is if you do that, everyone in the world will know that you're kind of around here and put problems down uh, because of Facebook. So, uh, that's not really a bad case. Uh, sensitivities vary, just like they do with poison ivy. So some people get really nailed, other people it's uh, irritating but not uh, life-changing. I think it is in some cases. Uh, one guy I, I was talking to said he wanted to get his chainsaw and cut his arm off. <laughs> but the other side of the coin, because the uh, caterpillars eat deciduous tree leaves, they also do a lot of defoliation. And uh, tens of thousands of acres each year in a relatively small area. Uh, I think if I lived here, I might be a little worried about getting a rash. Uh, and I, might, I might, might start thinking nuclear weapons or something. Uh, all right, so respiratory distress too. If you swallow the hairs, obviously that can be a real problem. Um, there are sections in England where they have bread infestation. Uh, a few years ago, a guy actually choked it and died because he swallowed too many of the hairs. All right, a little bit on history. I'm going to go through this quickly because, but you can see it was more widespread, and. Um, The range has fluctuated, but it's gotten progressively smaller, which is a good thing. So back in the 1900s, when it was really, uh, really bad, uh, intensive efforts, extensive efforts, we'll talk about all these different techniques. Federal quarantine, imposed, which still exists today. Um, So they were able to successfully knock it back pretty dramatically. There is a fungus. The genus name is Entophaga, which in Greek means insect eater. And lives on caterpillars. In this case, specifically the gypsy moth caterpillar, but there's a, a kissing cousin of this one that attacks brown tail moth, which is very helpful. In fact, uh, all the towns that have hit really hard, Brunswick, Bath, uh, Freeport, Harpswell, they all have to make decisions what they want to do. And some have tried spraying. Uh, I think Falmouth is going to have a big spray program this year. But Freeport decided to go with open for rainy weather. 
Uh, Unshy. Well, we'll get into this more detail later because I want to talk, talk, talk about this. But, um, fungi are very dependent on moisture conditions. In fact, uh, those that attack plants, if it's dry, there'll be no activity. If it's dry, they don't even bother to produce spores. Because when the spore lands on a plant leaf, it has to actually be in a film of water to germinate. So there's a tremendous... Uh, there's, one, there's actually one exception, just as a curiosity. You've all seen powdery mildew, right? Yeah, it's real common. One of the reasons why it's so common is the spore actually carries its own water with it. It's a little capsule of water, which is really a cool adaptation. And I always joke in entomology that, you know, we think buying these things as being uh, not very sophisticated. But somewhere a long time ago, they got to this point and they said, hey, we're doing fine. <laughs> we're going to stop right here. Maybe make minor changes. You know, unlike ourselves, which uh, look at the mess we've gotten ourselves in. But you know, these guys are going happy, no problems. <clears throat> so anyway, it gets bigger, it gets smaller. Uh, so it's a public health problem. So, the thing that uh, the state has attempted, and actually, actually local municipalities have paid for the spraying themselves, with insecticides has been moderately successful, but people are so chemophobic these days that uh, it's really hard to, particularly because you're either going to spray from a plane, or even if you're spraying from the ground, you're spraying up the trees and stuff, and drip, etc. There are a couple of insecticides that are, you can never say they're safe. It's actually against the law to say that something's safe because you can't prove that it's safe. But they're relatively non-toxic. Um, We'll talk about those a little bit, but pesticides now have such a bad reputation that people are pretty much willing to accept anything. I always tell the story about, I stopped to talk with the State University of New York and Agricultural College in Cobleskill, New York, and um, we had a uh, pine needle scale infestation on, on all of our pines. We had a lot of pines, Austrian pines. And it got so bad that it almost looked like it was snowing in the summertime because they were white. And uh, somebody said, hey, you know, we're in ag school. This surely shouldn't be happening. So we decided, okay, we're going to spray. And we're, all we sprayed, we are going to spray was uh, horticultural oil, which is the same formulation you put on your baby's butt for dry skin. <laughs> and we had to... Uh, put in what we call the daily bulletin, which went in everybody's email work on campus. And we knew we were going to have trouble because um, most of the trees are up by the library and the liberal arts section. Um, and I mean, we're, we're talking wackadoodles up there. And, uh, so, it's a true story. We put it in the daily bulletin. Friday morning, 6 in the morning, we're going to treat the trees. And we explained the whole thing about horticulture oil, and you know, I don't Noon time, get a call from the college president. Presidents of colleges don't like controversy. They like to sit in their office and raise money. Wow, well, what the hell did you do? What? He says, two people went to the hospital, three went to the infirmary. One had to be taken away in an EMT vehicle because of that spread. Well, it had rained that morning, we hadn't sprayed it off. <laughs> uh, but, anyway, highly controversial. In fact, when I worked just one, when I worked, uh, I used to work some summers with the U.S. Department of Agriculture, worked on a tree disease up in the Adirondack Mountains, which was the greatest job ever. But 
but um, at the time, they were, the USDA was spraying for gypsy moths. They were spraying uh, RV parks because the big way that they moved around was the eggs were laid on the RVs and then they you know, went to Oregon or wherever. They had to put in program because three times in a week the plane got shot at. What were they spraying? Um, it was actually, uh, what the devil was it? I don't remember now, but it was something pretty innocuous. It wasn't DDT or anything like that. Um, as a matter of fact, it was called Dimlin. It was a, a growth regulator that really wouldn't affect other things. All right, so here we go. Uh, so there are uh, wasps and flies that lay their eggs in the caterpillars, parasitize them. There are predators, uh, beetles, for example, that eat them outright, chew them up. But the, the greatest factor has been the fungal disease. Uh, do you remember, if you grow two tomatoes, you remember 2009? Like every tomato plant in Maine died. And it's a long evolved story, but it was because of a uh, pathogen called Phytophthora infestans, the same thing that caused the uh, potato famine in Ireland in the 1840s. Phytophthora means terrible plant destroyer. So <laughs> but it, it just like that, boom, boom, boom. Uh, and the reason was, 2009 we had a little over twice as much rain as normal in the summer. And in August we had moisture 22 of 31 days. And so it was just perfect for the fungus. And it just went everywhere. Just everywhere. And they got annihilated. So, anyway, the point is that moisture is the key. Now this happens to be Entomophaga faga mamega, which is the thing that's wiped out gypsy moth. I think most everybody here is old enough to remember that for lots of years, gypsy moth was the number one pest in the Northeast. Yes. Hundreds of thousands, if not millions of acres defoliated. Um, millions and millions of dollars of damage. And yet in recent years, they're still certainly around, but they've dropped off by probably 95%. And it's because of this critter right here. Um, it was introduced by, well, I'll skip through that. But anyway, the point is that it's been really affected when there's moist springs and early summers. And this is the spores that it produces. Um, the entomophaga, the faga that attacks brown tail moth caterpillars, once that caterpillar is eaten, the fungus will produce many as 20 million spores. And they just go shooting around in the breeze. So it's kind of a good thing because the more caterpillars there are, the better the chance the other ones have of getting disease. Was this fungus introduced? Sorry? Was it introduced, the fungus, or what was it? Yeah, it, uh, it was introduced in the early 1900s. It went nowhere. It disappeared off the face of the earth. And then suddenly in the late 80s, I can remember when I got a call from uh, one of my former students who was the head park from Westchester County. He said, you've got to drive down here and see this. And there were just dead gypsy moth capitals everywhere. It's almost, it's probably the most wonderful sight I've ever seen except for when our child was born. You know? uh, it's really great. They think that now that this one came in in the 1980s accidentally, bad things come in from overseas, good things come in. So that looks like. Yeah. <coughs> this is what Freeport is hoping for. <coughs> All right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, so you can see uh, the activity, acres defoliated. And if you check carefully, a lot of these lower 
foliation years, uh, you can correlate that to the fact that it was in rainfall or rainfall at the right time. It's kind of ironic because if we're in the brown tailed moth zone, we're looking for wetter conditions so we can get the fungus. But on the other hand, you really like dry conditions because the ticks will be inactive then. So it's, you know, maybe Nick will take a choice, I guess. This is a hand. Da, 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 da. This is the most recent map. Uh, Allison sent this to me last week. Um, red is high. Whatever the other colors is moderate. Uh, green is low. So you can see it's fairly localized. So they have found the moths in Milanaka now, just recently. But not enough to really be a hassle. But you can see, uh, you know, South Bristol, where I live, down the spot is right on the edge of me. Edgecombe, severe. Which way does the wind blow? Uh, one of the big questions that, that's not answered is why is it so localized? Gypsy moth took years to spread. I mean, the only reason it got out of uh, New England and got across uh, the Hudson River was the hurricanes of the 50s blew the females across because the female didn't fly. She just flutters around. But the brown tail moth adults are really good flyers. So it's not, not, not clear why this is going on, or why they're not all over the state. And, uh, but um, I, they're all around here, obviously. Uh, on the Miles campus, they're all over the place. Down South Bristol, we've got them all on 129. In a bad infestation, you can have a thousand nests in a tree. And there could be 400 caterpillars in a nest. Um, just as an aside, uh, there are four caterpillars that look very similar uh, that are fairly common. And uh, again, the best way to always tell the brown tail moth is the two orangish red dots at the end of its body. Um, the gypsy moth is really hairier and it's got blue and red. Um, forest tent has these keyhole things. And Eastern tent has two sets of blues going down. How do they present now? What are they, right now, this time of year, what are, what are, the, what are we looking at? Um, I think, uh, did you guys get the handout? Comparison of native and invasive yeah. quality models. It'll actually tell you on there exactly where they are each time of the year. Get back there, Bob. But we'll see that the uh, brown tail is in the nest. It will be coming out momentarily or as we speak, perhaps. It just takes one more day. All right, the life cycle. Fortunately, it's fairly straightforward. There's only one generation a year. So from egg laying adult to egg laying adult, it takes one year to go through all the rigmarole. So right about now, um, back in the fall, that first instar caterpillar, the one that came out of the egg, right? When the days got shorter, it made a nest. It'll leave surrounded by silk, which makes it pretty cold hardy. It's unusual for cold temperatures to wear them out. So that's how it spent the winter. Somewhere in March, it began to make some changes again, because I assume longer day length, or increasing day length. 
What it's waiting for are the buds to break. The trees in which it feeds. It feeds on a lot of deciduous trees. Apples and oaks seem to be its favorite. So it's waiting for the buds to break. And so as soon as we get a couple of warm days, they'll start to move out. And they'll actually start to feed on the buds if they're too early. So this is why if you're going to prune them out, you've got probably two days. <laughs> I always say by the middle of April, and it really depends on the year. Now, this seems to have been a relatively cool spring, though. The springs are usually pretty ratty. Um, so we may be a little later this year. Other years, it could conceivably be into March. Yeah, a long spell. So, what comes out is that second instar, it feeds on the foliage, and then now it goes through all of its stages. Molts five times. So we get to late June. Okay. Remember, after the second instar, the hairs become toxic. And so after that, every time it molts, it sheds its own skin, it's shedding thousands of these microscopic toxic hairs. Plus, some of them just become dislodged, fall off, etc. So what should we, because I'm picking up these cases I'm like, yeah. you know, from the trees. What should we do now when we have these cases? Um, why don't you let me get through this and there's a control part at the end, but the best thing always to do is to prune them out if you can, particularly if you have apple trees which, you know, are prunable. Um, if you have oak trees, it becomes a much greater problem, though there are arborists who will go up to 60 plus feet. And there's a list of names. The uh, Forest Service has compiled a list of names. There's like 25 of them, I think. But it's, it would be too late now because they've been booked for a long time. You actually want to do this back probably in November or December when you first start seeing them. You know you have enough to worry about. Um, and they come out and do an estimate. Obviously, if they have a piece of cherry picker, it's going to get pretty expensive. Yeah, no. uh, maybe a figment of my imagination, but I seem to remember in the past people used to use torches yes. to burn them. The you you can burn them. Um, you know, it's a little more destructive to the tree, right. but uh, all pruners are, you know, the best way to do it. You drop them into a bucket of soapy water, leave them overnight, and they'll be dead. Um, now, if I was telling Pam that I, I think it's Bodenham or one of those towns, the public library has bought uh, really long pruners. In uh, this happens to be some of the <laughs> some of them coming out of some nest that was thrown in a jar. <laughs> They're hungry. Yeah. All right, so now we've gotten through the caterpillar stages, right? We went from uh, late April, May, right through into June, early July. Now it's time to go to the next stage. That last instar caterpillar has reached full size. And what that means is it's stored enough fat that it's able to go through these complex changes and become a moth, which is a big deal. Its whole body is reconfigured. Its organs are reconfigured. So, she makes a cocoon using those toxic hairs, among other things, puts them around the eggs, and she tries to put them in protected places, sometimes just on the trunk of a tree. How big is the actual moth? Um, <coughs> I think there's a scale on them. Let me hang on and get to that. I think there's a scale on there. They're not. <coughs> this is what you don't want to see. We had someone call us up last winter. No, it wasn't winter, it was fall, late fall. And they said we've got hundreds, if not thousands, of these on the side of our house. They said, 
huh, that seems strange. You know, have that many. Um, you leave our light, outside light on at night, is that a problem? <laughs> yeah, that's a problem, all right, because they are attracted to light. So that's a good thing to keep in mind. <laughs> So I think we're pretty square away with that, right? This is a great picture. <laughs> this was taken by Jesse Ferrer over the gallery on his window. And you can see it's a work of art. Round tail moths everywhere clamoring for on their walls. All right, so a quick rehash of the life cycle. I probably spent more than enough time on this. Uh, any questions on the life cycle? Uh, hair activity, and it builds up as the summer progresses because not only they get bigger, but they've shed more and more times, and so forth and so on. <coughs> All right, so the hairs are microscopic. They blow around in the air. They're so light. They can stay toxic for one to three years. Wow. So that one handout that lists all the precautions to take if you're working in a caterpillar area. There are a number of caterpillars, different species that have toxic hairs. It's not uncommon. It's just that they seem to be particularly ferocious in this case. Um, you know, why do they do that? Because they don't want to get eaten. They don't want to get predated on. When you look at an insect, when it does something, there's a perfectly utilitarian reason. They never do things for stupid reasons. <laughs> Unlike some, you know, right? Uh, just like if you look at a grasshopper, we, we used to have, uh, in our entomology class, we had one night where we, the kids brought in insect recipes. There was a book called Butterflies in My Stomach, and it had all these recipes. And the kids would cook up everything, and we'd have cockroach pudding, and you know, me and the other guy would have to eat it. And when we ate the uh, grasshopper brownies, the damn legs would always get caught between your teeth because they had spines on them. Why would a grasshopper have spines on its legs? Because it helps it to climb up stuff, dig in, right? And uh, it helps it hold on in mating, and it also makes it more difficult, less palatable for birds to eat. Hey, Bob, are these toxic to animals? Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Because of the, you know, of their, uh, it's not so much the chemical, but it's the barbs themselves. Sure. Yeah. Not toxic to beetles, perhaps. I just chew right through anything. Uh, so again, this I hope you, if there's plenty of copies of that white sheet. Um, I think you can uh, pick up all these tips on that as well. But this is what you have to do if you're in an area that's inundated with them. Really want to wear a respirator when you uh, mow your lawn, and... but you know it might be necessary. Maybe the library could get those too. Yeah. Uh, so cold temperatures really aren't a big impact, but wet, cool springs, early summers are the key. Clipping is best. Humane actually has a minute and 30 second video on how to clip the tips off if you, if you want to watch it. Uh, this happens to be you know, the first group of arborists to will prune nest out. And as, just just uh, go to Google or Bing or whatever, just put in. Main arbors, green tail, this will come up. 
there's some people, a guy in Booth Bay, there's someone in Bath, Brunswick, and in Portland, obviously. All right, chemicals, here we go. Uh, if you're going to spray, you really would need to do it no later than the end of May. Because at that point in time, there's already got to be so many hairs and so much physical damage to the trees that it's not worth it. And here's a list of uh, arborists that will treat for brown tail moth. Spraying is always problematic. New York State, we had a thing called chemical trespass. If you were spraying in your yard and some of the chemical went into someone else's yard, they could physically, they could actually not have you arrested, but have you fined. It's pretty darn hard to spray a tree without some of it uh, getting off target. If you make the droplets really big, they're less likely to go anywhere, but they're more likely to run off the tree very quickly and not be as effective. If you make the droplets very small, like a mist, you get great coverage, but you know they're going to go all over the wind. takes them. This is one of the reasons why tree spraying is so unpopular. All right. If you were going to spray, if you reach that point, most people use either spinosid, even though it says S-A-D, it's pronounced S-I-D for some reason, spinosid and permethrin. You all know permethrin? Mm -hmm. You should know permethrin. I don't go outside anymore unless I'm on my lawn or my driveway without permethrin impregnated clothing and shoes and socks. Um, you use permethrin treated clothes, you're 74 times less likely to get a tick on you. If you use regular repellents, that's fine as long as you can check yourself really well because they don't work as well for some people as others. Anyway, enough of that. Um, So those are the two primary materials and BT. We'll talk about BT a little bit. It's a great material. It's incredibly safe. It's a biological. Unfortunately, it doesn't work super well. <laughs> However, well, there's some caveats there. All right. And now we've got the lobsters. It's, it's, it's injection. We're going to get to that. Yeah. Okay. Get to that. Yeah. That's a way to. Um, you all know lobster, right? And they're like farmers. Right? I come from a farming, another side of farming family. So the old joke if you put 20 lobstermen in a basement, what do you have? A wine cellar, right? <laughs> uh, yeah, yeah. A lot, a lot of my neighbors are lobstermen. They were, you know, the lobsters were 10 50 a pound two weeks ago off the boat. And you know, they're still complaining. But, they're, hey. but it, it is a, indeed a noble profession. And lobsters are, they've been burned in the past by pesticides, very seriously burned, um, by a number of them. And uh, consequently, you can understand why they're so concerned. So, because lobsters are such a big economic factor in Maine, uh, there are specific rules. Two hundred fifty feet, unless, unless biologicals like BT injected directly into the tree. Fifty to hundred. If you're spraying and you're between fifteen to one hundred fifty feet, you have to follow all these regulations. So you can spray within two hundred fifty feet, no closer than fifty. But you have to make sure you're spraying out of the wind, away from the water, etc., etc. All right, BT. Have any of you used this for in your gardens? Yeah, Bacillus thuringiensis. Um, it's been around for a long time. There are a lot of different varieties or subspecies. Uh, it's a higher bacterium, but what it does, it's a soil organism. 
And uh, what we do, uh, it produces a toxic crystal that contains, it produces a crystal that has a toxic protein in the center. And if that crystal dissolves, the toxic protein reacts with the stomach of the insect and basically destroys the stomach and the insect stops feeding the eyes. Why is that important? Because um, one of the subspecies only works, the, the, the crystal is dissolved only in an alkaline environment, okay? So it's effective only in an alkaline environment. Mammals, birds, fish, what's the pH of their stomachs? Yeah, I had too much coffee this morning, I can tell you right now. It's acidic, right? So consequently, no impact. Though there are, there are varieties that will work on different insects, but in the case of uh, Kertzicki or the caterpillar one, it only affects caterpillars. That's why it's such a crackerjack material if it works. Those are the, anyway, those are the crystals. Caterpillar killer. Um, Maine has experimented with it. It only works well early on. You have to get one of those, preferably even when they uh, come out of the eggs in, in August. They work best then. Um, because they're soil organisms, they break down in the sunlight, so they're not long lasting. Maine had given up, but uh, the woman from the State Forest Field, they told me that they've had luck with BT in England, so they're reevaluating treatment techniques now. Maybe going more with that fall rather than trying to get it when they come out of the nest when they're a little bigger. So that's the safest material you could use. Um, have you all seen the dunks? Where we live at Going away from our house, there's a low-lying area where water bubbles in the spring. This is Bacillus thuringiensis israelensis, discovered in Israel. It um, is a bacillus that destroys mosquito larvae, and it works crackerjack. I put these in the pools. Uh, they have really no impact on any other organisms, and knockback mosquitoes probably 98%. Uh, Spinosad. How many of you have used this? It's it's probably the premier organic insecticide right now. I get a formulation called Captain Jack's Dead Bug Spray. Uh, got a guy like Jimmy Buffett with me wearing a pan my hat on the, on the label. It was discovered in the Virgin Islands. Chemist was down there and he was walking past an abandoned rum distillery. And he saw a bacterium growing on the ground. And being a curious scientist, he grabbed some of it, brought it back to the United States, experimented with it, fermented it, and he found it was an unbelievably good insect killer that was also pretty much non toxic to humans and other insects. So it is accepted as an organic material. Um, it's the only thing I use in my garden. Works really well on caterpillars, Colorado potato beetle, for example, as well. It doesn't harm beneficials generally. The only problem it has is bees. Right? However, if it's allowed to dry for two to three hours, it's no longer harmful to bees. So you spray it late in the day, etc. All right, let's get near the end here. Injections. Remember the cross section of a tree? What do you mean? Anyway, here's the bark. Here's a layer called the cambium. It produces the phloem, which kind of sticks up down to the roots. And then on the other side of it's the xylem, which shoots water and nutrients up to the leaves. Um, when the phloem dies, it becomes bark. When the xylem dies, it becomes hardwood. Well, right here is where the active xylem is. So if you can stick something through that bark layer to there, the plant itself will move it up to the leaves. This is called systemic injection. 
Uh, this is the Moget system. It's if you hire someone to, to do the systemic, this is one of the techniques they may use. Get these little capsules, hide the simplicity, you just push the top down and you're creating enough pressure. You drill a hole, the stuff runs out of the tube into the tree, off it goes within hours, it's up there. Um, generally you put one every six inches around, but it, it, it depends. Alright, so that's one technique. Uh, no spraying, it's all isolated right in the tree. Just have to remove these things safely and discard them safely. What time of year do you do this? It depends basically on what you're trying to do, you know, whether you're fertilizing or going after disease or insect. In this case, um, it could be either May, late April, May, or uh, in August or September. And then uh, there's, a, there's probably 50 different techniques. This is an injector gun. uses uh, air pressure to shoot the stuff into the tree. So these are the safest techniques. Um, however, you, you shouldn't try them on apples. Because when systemic injections usually occur, would be when? May? What's happening to men? Blossoms. Bees. Bees get into that palm and nectar. So, if you're going to do it, you want to do it in August. <laughs> so, I mean, you could do that because you, you could figure out how long the stuff lasts and then you know, when you harvest the fruit. But, Oaks, this is great for oaks where it's so damn high you can't prune the nest efficiently. Alright, this is uh, that sheet I passed out that uh, explains some of the stuff. Let's see. So Maine has a whole lot of information. It's very, very good. Um, I was really impressed. I, this woman, Allison Canadi, I sent her a list of about a dozen questions that I had. She got back to within two hours. And if I had done that in New York where I lived and knew all the people, I'd be lucky to give me six months, right? Uh, any questions? So, I was told that there's somebody who will inject into the root ball, not into the tree. Well, you can do it directly into the trunk or the root flares. Where the roots come out and are above the ground at the base of the tree. You can also inject into the soil itself. That's what I thought. Yeah. I um, You know, as far as effectiveness, I think they all work pretty well. Um, it comes down to the preference of the arborist, how they, probably how they were trained to do it. A lot of people have switched over to the first two methods I showed you, that kind of thing, you go right into the tree itself. Jack, are you familiar with what they're doing casting names for Dutch elm disease? Sure. The Dutch elm disease, the killing elm trees, all yeah, that's how they say. What's the question? What was the question? About um, Dutch elm disease and uh, American elms that have survived, basically survived by a phenomenon called chance escape, just didn't get hit by spores. Well, they the beetle, the beetle that carries the disease. So when they are located, they are protected by systemic injection. However, there's a limit to how many times you can drill holes in the, in the trunk you know, over the years. And so forth and so on. Um, there was a guy at Cornell that worked with American elms for years. And he actually was getting close to good resistant varieties, look like the American elm. And then a mycoplasm, that's another type of microbe, came in and wiped out his whole skin. Oh, yeah. Three months. Uh, the problem with trees, they live too long. You know, 
People don't like to study trees because it takes... These churches like to do tomatoes. It's in and out one year. <laughs> trees, you have to be real patient. And, uh, anyway. Any other questions? Sir? Uh, BT, is, does that have a, a long shelf life? In other words, can you keep it out in the, out in the barn over the winter? Take BT? Yeah. Um, is it fairly dry? Yeah. Yeah. Um, I can't as I've got probably three years, two couple of years. Okay. Uh, as long as it's dry, that's the key. Yeah. But uh, the trouble is, it doesn't. As I said, it doesn't work super well to begin with, yeah. unless you get the early instars. So I'd be, I'd be skeptical. Of you. Anything else? Yes. So it sounds as though the fungus is fairly effective, but the insects are no, um, there's been a lot of efforts to actually harvest it and then release it in, in other towns, and it hasn't worked well. Not understood why. Um, there's so many things going on. You know, I think everything is so complex that uh, you know, it you think it would work. Um, just like when they brought the original Antonomophaga Faga in from uh, Europe, or actually Asia as well. Tremendously lethal there, and then it did nothing here. So many, so many efforts to. The first thing an entomologist does when we get a new pest is you go to the country of origin, because inevitably that pest is not a problem there. If it evolved there, something else evolved to feed on it, kill it. You know, there's always like five or six things. You know, just like uh, everybody's got enemies, no matter how simple the work is. It's got enemies. But probably 95% of the time when they've been imported to the United States, it hasn't worked. You know, climate's not quite right. Something wrong. Thank you very much. Thank you.